So Abraham's had his, had his last adventure, and he's 90 years old, 99 years old, actually. The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Well, that's quite the command. Now, Alexander McLaren, um, who we talked about before, ex 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 uh, elaborated upon this slightly, and this is what he had to say. It's, this is not precisely walking with God, the idea of walking before God. It is rather that of an active life spent in continual consciousness of being naked and open before the eyes of him to whom we have to give an account. Okay, so that's, that's an idea that's in keeping with the notion that what we're seeing in the Abrahamic story is the call to adventure of, the, of man, of the, of the typical person, right? Because your life, in some sense, is an adventure. And I suppose the reason for that is that you're confronted by things that you cannot understand, that you have not yet mastered. There's a heavy price to be paid if you fail to conduct yourself appropriately. And there's a large reward to be gained if you conduct yourself properly. And so that pretty much defines an adventure story. And God calls to Abraham and tells him to move out into the world, to leave what he's familiar with, to go into the strange lands of famine and tyranny, and to find his place. And, and that works out quite nicely for Abraham. And so, what that also means is that because Abraham is doing that consciously, at, at least according to this interpretation, that he's not naive in his, in his determination to move forward, you know. I mean, I've dealt with lots of people who have anxiety disorders, you know. And one thing about people who have anxiety disorders is they are not mysterious to me. I understand, it's, it's no problem for me to understand why people have anxiety disorders or why they're depressed or why they have substance use problems. The mystery to me is always why people don't have all of those things at once. Because everybody has a reason to be anxious. In fact, we have the ultimate reason to be anxious because we know that we're vulnerable and we know that we're going to die. And how you cannot be anxious under those circumstances is a great mystery. It's a massive mystery. And the same thing applies with regards to depression. And then the same thing applies to some degree with regards to drug and alcohol abuse. As I said last week, there's plenty of reasons to drown your consciousness in alcohol. That's for sure. We could refer to the aforementioned anxiety and depression, not least. And so, and the, and the sorts of drugs that people are prone to take are chemicals that take the affective edge off the tragedy of life. So, so back, to, back to the issue of, of, of fear. I mean, Abraham is self-conscious, that's what this commentary says, but the thing is, is he moves forward despite that. He's self-conscious and he knows the danger, but he moves forward despite that. And that's actually the appropriate response in the face of actual non-naive understanding of what constitutes life. Like if you're naive and you move forward, it's like, well, what the hell do you know? You know, there's no courage in naivety because you don't know what there is to stop you. You don't know what dangers you might apprehend, but to be aware of what it is that your problem is. So to be alert existentially, let's say, or to be fully self-conscious means that you're perfectly aware of your limitations and how you might be hurt. And then to make the decision to move forward into the unknown and the land of the stranger. Anyways, that's the, I would say, that's one of the secrets to a good life. And I, I can say that really without fear of contradiction, I would, I would say, because the clinical literature on this is very, very, very clear. What you do with people who are afraid, and, and to some degree depressed, but certainly anxious, is you lay out what, what they're anxious about, first of all, in, in detail. What is it that you're afraid of? What might happen? And then you decompose it into small problems, hypothetically manageable problems, and then you have the person expose themselves to the thing that they're afraid of, and, and what happens isn't that they get less afraid. That isn't what the clinical literature ex indicates exactly. What happens instead is they get braver, and that's not the same thing, right? Because if you get less afraid, it's like, well, the world isn't as dangerous as I thought it was, you know, silly me. If you get braver, that's not what happens. What happens is, yeah, the wo damn world's just as dangerous as I thought, or maybe it's even more dangerous than I thought, but it turns out that there's something in me that responds to taking that on as a voluntary challenge and grows and thrives as a consequence. And there's no doubt about this. Even the psychophysiological findings are quite clear. If you... If you... Can, if you impose a stressor on two groups of people and on one group the stressor is imposed involuntarily and on the other group the stressor is picked up voluntarily the people who pick up the stressor voluntarily 
voluntarily use a whole different psychophysiological system to deal with it They use the system that's associated with approach and challenge and not the system that's associated with defensive aggression and withdrawal and the system that is associated with challenge is much more associated with positive emotion and much less associated with negative emotion It's also much less hard on you because the the defensive posturing system the prey animal system man when that thing kicks in It's all systems are go for you. You know your <laughs> the gas is pushed down to the or the pedals pushed down to the metal and the brakes are on you're using future resources that you could be storing for future time right now in the present to ready yourself for emergency so there's, there's, there's nothing simple or trivial at all about the idea of being called to move forthrightly forward into the strange and the unknown. And there's a real adventure that's associated with that, right? So that's an exciting thing, which is part of the reason why people travel. And then also to see yourself as the sort of creature that can do that, is willing to do that on a habitual basis, is also the right kind of tonic for, I hate this word, for your self-esteem. You know, because the self-esteem has nothing to do with feeling good about yourself. As, as I already mentioned, there isn't necessarily a reason why a priori you should just feel good about yourself. But if you can view yourself acting in a courageous and forthright manner, and encountering the world and trying to improve your lot, and, and, and taking risks, you know, in a non-naive way, well then you have something that you can comfort yourself with at night when you're wondering what the whole damn point of, is, of your futile and miserable life. And so, and that's necessary because it's often the case that you wake up at four in the morning or at least sometimes the case that you wake up at four in the morning when things haven't been going that well and wonder just what the hell the point is of your futile and miserable life. You have to have something real to set against that. It can't be just rationalizations about how, you know, you're a valuable person among others even though that's true. That's not good enough. You need something that's more realistic to set against that and observing courage in yourself is definitely one of the things that, that, that can help you sleep soundly at night when, when things are destabilized a little bit around you.